This episode of Egalia Chats is brought to you by Egalia and our brand new Servo Collective, a community funding drive to support development of Servo, the only web engine to be written in a memory-safe programming language with modularity, embeddability, and parallel computing in mind. Visit servo.org to learn more and opencollective.com slash servo to lend your support. Okay, hi, I am Brian Cardell. I am a developer advocate at Egalia. And I'm Eric Meyer. I'm also a developer advocate at Egalia. And I am Melissa Wen. I am a Curdo developer at the Gaudia. And uh, on today's show, we're going to talk about colors. So there's lots of exciting stuff happening with color around the web. And uh, it's a topic that a lot of people are talking about now and getting excited about. Uh, I wrote a post about this called Unlocking Color in 2019, and I published it literally on New Year's Day in 2020. Um, so it was like a little over four years ago. And like in that time... We have a colleague, uh, Felipe, who gave a nice presentation uh, that made me think about all different kinds of aspects of this. Like, yeah, we can add the color to this, but like it needs support sort of all the way down. Like, so if we add it to Chromium, there's a lot. So his post was called uh, Toward Richer Colors on the Web, and he gave some talks. And then a little while later, uh, I noticed that our colleague, Melissa, was suddenly writing and publishing all these things. And it was like, wow, we're, we're just getting started digging into this. So Melissa yeah. is coming at it from the other end. Like, kind of tell us what you're working on. Yeah, I, I understand this perception of, wow, we are talking about it as a new thing today. But it's well established. And I see that. And the thing is, I'm working in the kernel side but mostly to enable the hardware capabilities that we have. We are advancing in the hardware side to get many of these color transformations and all the needs that we have in the color space for um, color expert. So we can offload this to the hardware to do that. We will get uh, more responsive results from all this transformation than if we do that on the user space side, in the software level. So this is why I am working on uh, like exposing all the hardware capabilities to the users, real users uh, take advantage of this. So when you say you're pushing it to the hardware side, is that CPU, GPU, both? Uh, GPU, uh, I mean, on, yeah. on display hardware, we say that uh, because sometimes we have this confusion about GPU as 3D, uh, rendering and graphics mm. and also display hardware IPs. So we have like a dedicated hardware for display to manage display needs, connectors, and uh, all the composition, plain compositions, things like that. And we have it on hardware and we have it in our board. So we can use kind of uh, hardware blocks dedicated to do each of this color transformation that we already use and know as the color expert. Mm. So can I ask a naive question? So yeah. <laughs> you talk about color transformations. So this means basically we're giving some data about a color, like the, I have like the CSS color keyword or like the ANSI keyword, right? Red. Well, what does that mean? Right? Like it means something concrete and it doesn't mean that well, you might have to display that on even a black and white screen, right? So are these color transformations are like, you've expressed a color, but like somewhere along the way, it's decided because either it's not capable or for maybe for some other reason that like that color profile isn't like available and we need to change what is displayed. Is that, is that what the transformations? Exactly. It's one of the things that we do uh, when we are talking about color transformation. One is we have a range of colors that one device is capable to, for example, capture, but we have another uh, range of colors that uh, the display device will reproduce. Uh, so we need some color transformation to kind of adapt or match different color range between all these devices. And we also have the standard uh, like sRGB, PQ, different standard, different uh, content that we need to match, for for example, in the input and the range that we have in the output. So it's one of 
the situation that we apply color transformation, but we also apply color transformation, for example, to improve the, the user experience when watching a video or playing a game uh, in the scenario to like add some kind of different feeling like subjectiveness, like if uh, we want a, a scenario more calm or with more action and we can change uh, colors to another, um, like a different space that match the feeling that we want to uh, to catch the, the, the audience for free. So mm. I, I see different things. Also, for example, night mode, when we are watching something in a, a black room, or when we are reading something uh, in with the sunlight, so you know we we can we start to color transformation and calibration to to uh, improve the user experience. That's fascinating. I didn't even think of that. I, I guess let me, let me ask a question just to make sure that I understand what you're saying there. Yeah. <laughs> so I know, like with my phone or my laptop, they have like auto kind of color sensing, not not color sensing, I guess light sensing. And I guess they can detect sort of like the color temperature and make auto adjustments of the brightness. Do they also potentially, I guess, because you change the yeah. brightness, it would change the matching of colors too? Yeah, I, uh, to be honest, I am not completely sure how this device would be connected to the color features that we have on mm. the other side. But yeah, we can do it. We can also do it manually. Like we can, as a user, and I feel the temperature is not uh, comfortable to me. So yeah. I can try to use features in my system to calibrate for something that is good for me. Because what is good for me, maybe is not good for you. But you can also uh, let the system to decide automatically. I think it, uh, it makes sense. It's a use case. I don't actually know how the communication happens, but yeah, mm. uh, it's one of the use case. Yeah, I, just an example from uh, my mobile device, I have an iPhone and I'm, I'm pretty sure this is what you're talking about. On my iPhone under display and brightness, there are two different color changing things. One is what's called true tone that says automatically adapt iPhone display based on ambient lighting conditions to make colors appear consistent in different environments. So it, Somehow it is sensing the nature of the ambient light, just not not just the level, I think, and trying to make the color of the display appear consistent, whether or not I'm inside, you know, not very well lit room or I'm outside in the sunlight. And then I also have a thing set on my phone called night shift, which is after a certain time. In my case, it's 11 o'clock at night. The display kind of reddens. It gradually shifts from sort of the daytime to this this warmer set of tones, which is supposed to be more relaxing. Um, and that's, it's purely a color shift. And I'm sure that Android phones have similar capabilities and, yeah. and other devices. The night shift is the one that I think of the most because while it's gradual, it's gradual over, you know, 15 or 30 seconds or something like that. So it's noticeable, even if I'm not looking at the time or if I'm like doing something where, like if I'm doing a crossword on my phone, uh, which I sometimes do, and suddenly it it starts to redden a little bit, like the display, all the all the whites become this get this orange tint. I'm like, oh, it's eleven o'clock. <laughs> um, it's later than I thought. It's easy as a user or even as an author, like as a CSS author, I work with colors all the time and I manipulate colors all the time, but I don't ever really think about what it takes to combine all of these colors and to display them well, right? In various situations. And that's, sounds like what you're working on, Melissa. And also not just that, but making it more performant so that on my, hopefully my phone has hardware to handle color transformations. Um, and that would be less power draining than doing it all on the CPU and, and sort of at the software layer, having to write your own code to to do all that stuff. It's actually what we are trying to do with uh, the kernel work right now. That is like save uh, resource and uh, mm. 
power from uh, one side and and do it in the in dedicated and and uh, specific uh, hardware parts that mm -hmm. can already know what to do and can do it within a very smart way. So, yeah. and this this is the Linux kernel specifically. It's uh, hardware capabilities. I am working on Linux kernel, yes, mm -hmm. and. For example, you will already find many of these uh, capabilities enabled in other operating system. And mm. on the Linux, we have other challenges. For example, uh, we have different compositors. Uh, we need a generic API on Linux that uh, fits all hardware vendors that we have, all capabilities that are, vary a lot. So mm. that's why I can see that for example, a past discussion seems like, oh, we are talking about it just right now and it's not actually what happened. And for example, these discussions uh, around color, ca color capabilities from uh, enable, I mean, hardware capabilities is also old in our side and our career community, but we have all this combination to do and consensus to reach that take a lot of time to find the, the, the best and the right solution and something that we uh, can uh, cover all needs uh, from the hardware side, but also from the user space side. And for example, when I talk about the variety of compositor that we have, that, you know, the desktop that we, we use to display uh, our content on, uh, on our laptop, uh, so we have different compositor, we have different projects uh, like GNOME, uh, like KDE and Sway and many compositor Westerns on Linux and they, they have their infrastructure uh, and they have different implementations to do the same thing, to get a content and then to display it in the right way, considering uh, the technology, uh, the output technology that a user has. So that's the, one of the variety of things that we have, I mean, in the user space side. But we also have on the kernel side, different hardware vendors, GPU vendors, like AMD, Intel, Nvidia, Qualcomm, etc. So we need to, you know, provide a generic solution that cover uh, and embrace all this need. And it's not that easy. I don't know, Eric, if you had the same feeling when Melissa was talking about it takes a very long time. <laughs> like, mm. yeah, I, we can relate to that. We work at web standards, right? Yeah, it um, takes, a long, takes a long time to get consensus and decide what the right way forward is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of, one of our favorite that. topics has been going since 1991. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of a, a slow process we can appreciate. Uh, yeah, it's difficult. But, um, you know, when we talk about like Linux, I think like it's one thing to talk about like the Linux desktop. It's um, important, but also considerably small in the population. But there's all these other things that are Linux that people use, like everyday consumers use. And this affects those things too, right? This would affect like televisions or maybe Steam Deck. Is this like something that yeah. would affect the Steam Deck or... Yeah. And also, for example, on Steam Deck, that we have the first device using LCD uh, display, and now we have the OLED device. So the the technology had a different need from the previous one, uh, the display technology. So OLED, mm -hmm. we can get, I, 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 I say more color, it's not right, but, you know, we can get up a larger range of colors. Uh, mm -hmm. with OLED display than we get from the, the LCD display. So the, my work on AMD GPU was actually like a base to have this OLED uh, screen on Steam Deck. Uh, it was not only my work. It was, uh, you know, many layers in the Linux display stack with contributions from AMD developers from the community, the, the Linux display community from, for example, Joshua that worked together with me uh, to enable it on Gamescope. And then we have Jeremy Salon uh, as a color expert that uh, provide the, the requirements, check if we are reaching these uh, requirements. So 
Uh, it was a lot of work to get, for example, this device to, with this uh, new technology. And I can see for all the others uh, device that, that we have all this color concept, all this research around colors apply on, on, not only on the hardware side, but also in this different display technology that we have now uh, available in the market. It's fascinating how much there is that goes into this. Like, I think like as a consumer or even like as a developer who's like, oh, I'm going to use this color in CSS. Um, and it's like this really hyper pink that is super saturated and like what it go, what goes into what has to all agree to make that happen and to make that really a uh, a common thing is amazing so like even at the very top level it's not just css right it's like can you use those in your images can you use those colors in canvas you know are all kinds of things in there and everything only benefits when all of the pieces are in place. And so once you have that, then the question is, can Chromium or WebKit or whatever, can it send it down to the next layer? And then can that send that down to the next layer? And then can that coordinate with the hardware and the, you know, the color management and the operating system level stuff? And like, it's so many layers of things I have to agree. It's really fascinating. It's hard to really appreciate like just how many people and how many aspects of the technology have to go into this. Yeah. There's a simpler thing that I think is a nice illustration, which is just if you ever go to paint your living room or something <laughs> and you go to the store and you see all the paints and then you bring them home and then they look nothing like they looked in the store, right? That is like an illustration of where just even in the physical world, the, the lighting doesn't match. The surrounding colors don't match. Like two colors will look different if they're next to one another. Yeah. Color is not the constant that we think it is. Right. So maybe Melissa can sell for us once and for all. What color was the dress? Remember the dress? The <laughs> yeah. Viral? The dr yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For me, I uh, was uh, white and gold. Like, I thought it was like a hoax. Like, I thought people were like trolling on the internet. I was like, <laughs> like, how can you? It's blue. It's clearly blue. Like, <laughs> I, like I had to ask a bunch of people. Like, I, I opened it on like several devices until I finally found one where it looked, wow, yeah, that doesn't look blue. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for example, I can imagine a situation that two people uh, looking to the same device and seeing different colors of the same Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And I think sometimes it's what happened. Uh, for example, when I am talking with a friend and I talk about, oh, can you pick this blue thing? And they say, no, it's green. And I said, no, it's blue. And we are in this kind <laughs> of, you know, <laughs> yeah. discussion of uh, what what is the name of this color for, for each of us. And um, I can imagine this, but also there are other factors that I learned during this uh, journey. That, for example, if we are like a person that usually work during the daylight, so we uh, we usually have a different uh, perception of the same colors in, in comparison with other that prefer to work uh, during the whole night, for example. And sometimes we, when we are like watching to a specific side of the display. We need time to accommodate our eyes to see, for example, also issues when I, when we have some issues, some compositions issues on display that I need to, for example, fix it or try to find the bug and try to find a solution. First time I can't see any issue and then I need to replay many times to and really uh, with uh, the right focus in, on the screen to actually catch the, the issue that someone reported. So we have this time to, uh, I think not only our eyes, but our brain, of course, <laughs> you know, accommodate and focus on the right thing to actually see what we, we are looking for. So wow. I, I see many uh, nuance, I can say like that, in uh, uh, the same scenario, you know, in the same situation. Yeah, that that hadn't even occurred to me that color compositing and color rendering bugs can literally depend on 
what time of day it was and what the lighting situation was and what angle the person was looking at the display from. I thought, <laughs> I thought dealing with web layout bug reports was difficult, but I generally don't have to ask, okay, what kind of monitor was it? What year was it? What angle is your monitor at? What kind of light bulbs do you use in your office? How many do you have? Were they on? <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's, oh, wow. I, I don't envy you that that work. I just remember a situation that during the, the last XDC, uh, during my presentation, I used uh, different colors to describe each feature that we have and the currently in, on the AMD driver. And I was talking about this difference uh, of how we see colors on different device and, and screens. And then one of the audience those just after the presentation told me, oh my God, it was amazing because you are talking about this issue. And then I was actually see it in, in real time, in run time that <laughs> uh, because I was in front using a, a, a display uh, that was uh, showing a set of colors, but in another uh, TV that was uh, near th uh, that guy, he just told me, oh my God, the color was different. And sometimes I can't see, uh, it was no colors, like it was completely uh, white. And wow. it was, oh my God, yeah, so such difference. <sighs> There's so much. So much here. I was just looking yeah. back at your uh, some of your you you have two or three talks and and a bunch of blog posts about work on AMD uh, the Steam Deck work right? Yeah, I am not very comfortable for public speaking. You know, uh, I prefer to write things in my time and then I can review it, think again, and think. <laughs> And, and yeah, yeah I, I don't feel so uh, very comfortable or confident, uh, um, yeah, to speak in public. So that's why it was a hard time, to be honest, <laughs> during the yeah. <this> talk <laughs> that I gave. It was only uh, one talk and one lightning talk to summarize uh, a workshop that I, that I led uh, about colors in the same conference. Uh, and we are, we are also organizing this year, Igalia are, are, is organizing the Linux Display Hackfest this year, next month. And this is, the, the, our goal is uh, keep the same, that is, we need to push the addition of uh, new features to take advantage of all the hardware capabilities and to understand also all the variety of uh, hardware capabilities that we have, because for example, I know a little of AMD uh, hardware, but I see different vendors with different, uh, doing different uh, things to get the same result, a better result to enhance uh, color results, I can say like that. Yeah. And then uh, we are trying to find consensus uh, across the stack but also to understand what is the, this diversity that we are talking about. So this, is, mm. this will be, a, a, you know, a time to get more information of the needs, requirements, and the goals to, to try to put everybody uh, together and, and just improve and move. Uh, I wanted to mention that I, I know, I think I reached out to you about this actually, Melissa, that like you have like great titles and head, like, I like the way that you write and present. So like your talk was called like the rainbow treasure map and uh, <laughs> they had like treasure map and magic frogs and steam deck rainbow. It's just, <laughs> it was like really entertaining. But then when I start to look at the thing in the post, my eyes glaze over because I'm like, wow, there's so many terms I don't understand. <laughs> So, um, I, like, I have questions because like, I want to understand it better. Right. So like, there's this word that gets thrown around in all these, like the user space. Like, can you tell me what, what does that mean? Oh, do you mean what user space is, is, is that it? Yeah. So this is like the user space can use the GPU oh, accelerated. Oh color yeah. Okay. 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 Oh, it's hard to, to describe. <laughs> Uh, we we actually divide, for example, uh, when we see the operating system, 
-hmm. we actually uh, split this into size, the kernel side and the user space side. So everything that is in the, in the kernel side, that's basically the core of the, the operating system uh, work. I mean, the communication between the software level with the hardware. The kernel is the, the layer that communicates directly with the, the hardware. And then uh, we have uh, another layer on top of the kernels. Oh, that is what I call user space uh, side. Uh, so we kind of communicate with the hardware. We have a layer to protect the hardware. So everything is in the kernel. And then we expose as APIs to uh, this, uh, another uh, level of software that we use this capability like uh, after all this uh, intermediation between uh, uh, operating system and, and hardware. So the kernel side is this layer very close to the hardware and then we have user space. So user space comprises of the composer that I mentioned, but also uh, applications all these this different open source projects that we have on Lena. So basically it's that. I don't know if uh, was... Yeah, that's good. That's pretty good. Um, there's another part of this that I, you know, consumer and somebody who does like certain kinds of programming, like I don't think about, but there is built-in DRM here and that's like actually at the kernel level. Is that right? Uh, yeah, the DRM. Yeah. The, yeah. Oh, what is DRM? Okay. <laughs> no, no, but where does that fit? Like, I, I wouldn't expect it to be a part of this. Like, you know, like as a, yeah, I guess maybe it is a little bit, what is DRM? Because for me, I, I think of DRM as something that is just like encryption key almost, you know, like you just, if you have the key, then you can unlock, but somehow it has to do with this. So I, like it's in your presentations and I'm, I'm curious to understand how and, and why, if it's possible to explain it to a yeah. lay person. Right. Why does a color space need DRM? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, weird because DRM uh, uh, is an abbreviation to two different things. <laughs> really? Yeah. But so the, uh, when I talk about uh, Linux DRM, we are talking about the subsystem on Linux, a part of the, the, the Linux kernel dedicated to GPU drivers. So it's a subsystem of, of the Linux kernel uh, when we will find all GPU drivers that uh, Linux support. So this is the DRM and uh, is it has direct. nothing to do with digital rights management. Yeah, no. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, today uh, I learned. And then, uh, so it's a subsystem. Uh, we we have like uh, a library, the, the libdrm, that is the layer used by user space to communicate with the interface between the Linux kernel subsystem called DRM and any project that need to, you know, get resource from the GPU or need mode settings that display. Yeah, so... Yeah, so DRM in this case, I just looked it up, stands for Direct Rendering Manager. Yeah, exactly. That's fascinating. Yeah. It, it has nothing related with the the the, the other DRM. Like yeah. you, Brian. Today I learned. I'm literally <laughs> learning this by looking at the Wikipedia article while we while we talk. There's another part of this that I didn't really. I mean, I don't. You would think that I would have thought of it, but I, I haven't blending right like we're talking about compositor and like i guess we need to have two layers that could sit on top of one another and then you only see one in the end right yeah yeah exactly and that must add a lot of complexity because can't those two colors even be in different color spaces yes it, it, this is uh one of the wow. things that I, we need this uh color management when i call pre-blending that is before blending, because uh, we have different planes on, on, on our uh, KMS framework. We have Can you one, explain what, what you mean by planes? Yeah, uh, for example, we have, uh, it's an abstraction 
for content from the frame buffer that will be displayed on the screen. So this abstraction, we have, for example, the size, rotation, we have different uh, properties uh, okay. on this plane. For example, we have a plan or cursor, only for the cursor. Oh, and okay. this is, you know, uh, moving around the screen with a, diff uh, a specific size, the size of the cursor. And then we have the primary uh, plane that we can say like, I, I, I will use this, this is not actually right, but I use this term, uh, the background, uh, you know, the, the, the layer uh, in the bottom. So and the then... zero index in the stack. <laughs> yeah. And then, well, for example, we have a video and for to use uh, uh, our resource in the best in the best way we usually detach a plane specific to to play a video from you know the your windows system your desktop environment and then we ha we only have one screen right we don't we are not yeah. using many uh screen uh like transparent screen uh uh, in a stack, so we we only see everything blend. That is what we call blend. So we uh, collect all this plane, like the cursor, the the video, and the, the desktop, uh, and then we blend it in one uh, stream. And, and then uh, we can do color transformation before this blending, because, for example, as you as you said, uh, we have we can have different content, different range of colors in each of this plane. For example, we can have also one SDR and other ADR plane, for example, uh, content. And then we need to put everything in the same uh, light space, the color space, a uh, different uh, also gamut. So we need to put everything in the same. Usually we put everything in the linear uh, light space before blending to get the correct values of each colors. And then after that, we can also do other color transformation occurred to, for example, the, the display that we will output it. So this is what I call blending and pre-blending, post-blending. During my talks and, during, and in my blog post, we will find these terms. And this is what I am talking about. So I'm imagining now like, okay, so I have like, my document and I have a background and that background is like a lab color. It's like, and then I have, uh, you know, I have like several divs that are each their own layers. They have their own Z index stacking context. And they're like, maybe this one is sRGB and this one is lab. And this one has an HDR image inside that. Another one has like a video that's HDR. And then I put those and I do them into like a 3D transformation so that they're like a cube that's rotating. And, yeah. <laughs> and then that gets put on an area of my screen where I have like a split monitor and like half of it is on one monitor and half is on the other monitor. Wow. The yeah. amount of things that are being calculated in that and, and the transformations and the blending and everything that happen in real time at at least 60 frames per second is amazing. And I guess it's uh, people like Melissa that make it amazing all the time. So <laughs> thanks for that, because uh, I like seeing cool demos that do things like that. And, and, and if you think about, for example, I call about a, a feature called uh, 3D lookup tables, 3D LUT. And it's the best uh, what we have right now to do color transformation, but it needs a lot of resource and it's very complex because it's a cube that we map a color from one part of the, this cube to another side of it. And this is why it's important to have this kind of feature as a capability in the hardware, because we can do a very powerful color transformation, but in a time uh, that doesn't compromise the, the, the experience, the, the usability of, for example, a game that it, we, we are, you know, in a very high refresh rate. So this is why it's important to have it in hardware because on software it would be slow, for example. Yeah, so the mapping, you say, what you're saying is that the best 
available technique for this particular thing is essentially doing 3D transformations, like transformations in 3D space, which is what GPUs are engineered to excel at, is that sort of calculation. So being able to offload that to the hardware is just an all-around win um, because the chips that are being used to do the calculations have been optimized at the hardware level to do those things quickly and efficiently. But yeah. is it specifically that a sort of a lookup function, this lookup table, is like having that specifically built into the hardware? Is that what you're saying? Or Yeah, in the hardware, we, we kind of receive, for example, uh, the 3D LUT, we would need uh, many elements in this lookup table. If we want this 3D lookup table, you can imagine one lookup table, but in, in three dimensions. Mm. Then if we have it, for example, RGB uh, system, all the combinations, it's a lot of combinations. Yeah. And uh, it's impossible to do it <laughs> in, a, in a useful time, we can say like that. So the mapping to go from a value of a color and go to another one in um, opposite side of the cube. Uh, and then uh, why I, I think it's very uh, powerful because we can kind of um, manage RGB, the three channels in one time. Wow. Uh, so we have it on hardware. For example, AMD use uh, Citra Hero interpolation to get its value. So what we do on user space, we we send to the hardware uh, our lookup table, our uh, transformation on, uh, on with only like 17 elements to each dimension. And then we, we send it to the hardware and the hardware does all mathematical calculation and interpolation, everything needed to reach the, the final result, the expected result from this input. So this is how we save a lot of CPU time, a lot of calculation using the, the, the hardware uh, capabilities. And all of this has to happen if, I, if someone just says something like color pink, but then that goes out onto the web and onto you know, billions of devices and this sort of color management is happening everywhere effectively, right? And, and we, we actually need color uh, management because we have a variety of input and output device. Right. So we actually need some kind of color transformation or we will have a very awful result of a color to watch it, something. So uh, color, trans color management uh, is everywhere, yeah. So our, our work, you've been working on the, the graphics team here at Egalia and the work that you're talking about here is a lot of it is upstream. Is it all upstream or is some of it not upstream? Uh, everything that I did is upstream right now. Okay. Uh, and we started with like this, what we, I call a driver specific solution. Uh, so we have this color management pipeline for AMD and only for, for this GPU right now. And it's uh, our main goal is uh, find the generic API solution and the community is already working on this. So uh, why we started with this driver specific solution? Uh, one of the reasons is because uh, we don't actually know all the capabilities that each hardware vendor provides to the system. So we need to know it, but also to play with it to understand better what we can do with each hardware block, for example. And we can only do that if we expose this capability to the users uh, that will actually examine it and, and use it in the right way for, for users, uh, operating system users. So we started with this uh, driver specific solution, but our goal is find a generic solution to expose the, the color management pipeline uh, from each GPU vendor. And yeah, my work is upstream. Uh, we at Galia work on upstream solutions and prioritize upstream work. 
And then I, I keep working on improvements and, and then reach the, the, the community need, uh, the Linux community needs around this topic. So to ask a naive question, oh, yeah. <laughs> where is upstream? I mean, this is just in the Linux kernel or? Yeah. Uh, so we have Linux, uh, we have the repository and different sites. We have the, the GitHub repository from uh, well, what we call mainline kernel. It's managed by Linux star vote, but we also have, for example, subsystem repositories. Like we have one repository on GitLab, a free desktop, uh, instance managed by the the maintainer, the DRM maintainers. And uh, we have another specific branch for MD. So it's a tree uh, that of different repositories from different maintainers and different advice drivers. Uh, for example, I submitted to the MD specific repository and it goes to the the DRM branch, and then it goes up to the GPU uh, maintainer branch, and then it goes up to the mainline kernel, uh, the Linux server uh, repository. But for example, my work already reached the mainline, so it, you can find it all on mainline kernel and the official release of the, the, the kernel from uh, 6.8 version, if I recall correctly. And all, all of this work is uh, for the Steam Deck, right? This work on AMD driver specific color management work was sponsored by Valve. Yeah, we work with Valve to find this uh, solution for Steam Deck, but also all the community contribute with uh, reviewing the work and uh, asking more details and also asking some uh, limitations according to the subsystem requirements for API uh, to, to uh, enable something on API. For example, if you want to, to get this uh, capabilities to have it uh, listed as properties, uh, if you are, a, for example, a compositor uh, developer and want to play with these capabilities, MD capability, color capabilities, you need to compile the kernel with a specific flags, uh, C flags, because uh, it's not a generic solution. Uh, we were not able to expose it by default in the kernel. So you need to set up a specific flag and uh, compile the kernel with this flag to see this property, for example. I have so many questions about what it's like to do this kind of work, really. <laughs> Yeah, because but <laughs> like even to simple things, like how long does it take to compile a kernel? And depends on uh, how many modules you need for your system. For me, it's around uh, seven minutes in my in my laptop. It's not bad. Yeah, in my in my laptop, it's a very um, common laptop. It's not you know this powerful laptop. It's a normal user laptop, so it's not that much. I see other projects that need much more time than, than I. <laughs> yeah, 10 years ago or so, I tried to compile Chromium, and it, I think it took eight, eight or nine hours. So a long yeah. time to wait to find out if your code even compiled. Yeah, uh, if, you, if you have, for example, many modules on, on the kernel, on my laptop, uh, it takes like uh, 20 minutes. It's hmm. not that much. But then how do you do you just simply run tests that are inputs and outputs, or do you like replace the kernel in your running operating system? <laughs> like, how does that work? I, I have like testing machines that I, okay. yeah, and then I replace the kernel in this testing machine using the, the same operating system that it already has. I just, uh, replace the kernel with my custom kernel with the things that I am developing. And then I can use both the, for example, composters. I can use uh, uh, user space uh, applications and projects to test it. But I also have some testing tools specific for GPUs that we, it's kind of a set of script that we, we check all the, the values that we get from the GPU when we submit a batch of 
elements uh, to the GPU, and then we can check the output. It, we can compare the expected color values, for example, from user space composition with the color values that we get from the GPU, and then we can check if they match or not. It's amazing, you know. Like I don't even, I don't even think about this stuff until we start talking about it. And then there's, I realize there's so many things to think about. Like, how do you even test that? Like you were talking about, <laughs> my head goes to like, well, well, I don't know. Are there like headless GPUs, and you can like throw values at them and see what they return? And yeah, that's <laughs> what a what a fascinating area that I give absolutely no thought to in my life, but makes everything in my life so much better. <laughs> Yeah, and you you just mentioned about a headless uh, GPU, and then I remember that, for example, on DRM, on the subsystem, we have the VKMAT driver that I am also the maintainer of this driver. It's a virtual uh, KMAT driver, so we, it's like a GPU vendor agnostic. So we are actually testing the subsystem uh, helpers, the common code, and if what we have in the subsystem, the software level, is doing what what is expected, and we can test this this layer without worrying about a specific thing from each hardware vendor, for example. So we have also this virtual driver there, and yeah, so many, many things. I I also for them sometimes I I also want to check something on my personal laptop on my work laptop, so I just replace the kernel. The here and then, because for example, it's a different uh, hardware version or it's a different uh, hardware vendor, and I want to check in multiple systems and setup. So I I I'd also do this kind of change replacement uh, of the kernel in my uh, laptop. So it's not very complicated. Sometimes you cannot. <laughs> boot your system if you do something wrong in your kernel. So I was just going to ask that. Like, it seems scary, like a little bit like you're doing like open heart surgery. Like what if you <laughs> kind of yeah. want to be real careful with that or else you might not be able to boot it and see the screen. Uh, yeah, but on Linux, you can just uh, switch between the kernel. So you have the kernel from the distribution that you are using and then you have your custom kernel. So you can... Uh, select which kernel you want to use now. So if your custom kernel uh, is not working as expected, you can just go back to, to your distribution. Dicer, yeah, Dicer uh, kernel. <laughs> we, we started to talk about kernel. <laughs> we started to talk about kernel and not about colorants. <laughs> this, I mean, this is fascinating. Like, this is so outside my normal area of things that I think about. So I love when I get to talk to somebody who actually understands this. <laughs> Hopefully I hope other I am people... explaining <laughs> correctly. Sorry. Well, I'm learning a lot. I don't know about you, Eric, but I, I've yeah. learned a lot on this. So I don't even know how to ask this without sounding like pretty silly because you, you would think that I would know the answer to this question. But um, like Linux kind of came from Unix you know, and then Mac is like kind of forked off that. There's like Darwin. So it's like, it is sort of Linux. But then also like Android is like Linux based, but it's really AOS. It's not just Linux. So yeah, this fascinates me like, because we do things that are like collectively good, right? So we do this work upstream. And then it's not like a single thing that benefits from that. This is like I was trying to say, like, it's not just like the Linux desktop, you know, it's also the Steam Deck and also maybe some devices that are built even with like WPE or something, right? Like um, that are truly Linux based. You know, what about Android devices at that level? Are they sharing similar code? Do you know or? Yeah, I don't know. I, to be honest, I don't know much about Android uh, I'm development. I'm very happy to hear that because I, <laughs> I felt like maybe I should know the answer to that. But if you don't know the answer to that, then I feel a lot less silly. In general, we need uh, a specific uh, developers and expert for to deal with Android. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, 
is what I understand from from this <laughs> topic. Yeah. But I actually I am actually not the best person to to talk about Android. I don't yeah. have yeah a, a a full picture of this development. But for example, I know uh, that around colors, uh, talking about the color topic, I know that Google, for example, we have the Chrome OS, and they are very interesting on improve color uh, management on Linux, you know, plain uh, management for ATR support too. So they are engaged on, on, on this topic, at least for Chrome OS, but I don't actually know much about Android development. So if you know the answer to that question, <laughs> uh, yeah, probably there's somebody at Agalia who knows the answer to this. Yeah. So we should probably I... just ask and get the answer, but. So Eric, any final questions or comments for Melissa? This will make me appreciate much more what goes into just displaying colors on screens. So yeah. thank you for that. Thank you guys. I think, you know, color on uh, Linux is a collective work and we are, as we talk during this time about uh, many layers, many uh, contributions from different uh, side, different point of views, experts, people that just want the best for, for Linux, uh, for, for our project. So it's kind of a collective work. And I would like to thank everyone that, you know, each contribution is important for, for it. So I can see how everyone contributes to improve the state of display on Linux. Excellent. Thank you, Melissa. Really appreciate it. Thank you.